Today, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Amelia Liu from uh, the School of Physics and Astronomy at Monash uh, speaking, uh, speaking to us today. Um, and Amelia has got a, a, an interesting background that's uh, sort of in, in, informative for our younger uh, ECRs who are sort of looking forward to their careers. So um, Amelia was a graduate, uh, PhD graduate of University of Melbourne in 2003, and then went on to work at, uh, at Argonne National Labs in Chicago, well, just outside Chicago, um, uh, 2004 to, to 2007. Um, then back in 2008 to Australia, uh, to Monash, where she was first of all a Margaret Clayton Woman, um, woman in Research Fellow um, in Physics. Um, later during the uh, 2014 to 2018 period was uh, managing the uh, research capabilities of the Center for Electron Microscopy here, Monash. And then most recently, um, major success as an ARC Future Fell, which is um, ongoing as we speak. So that's, um, that's, it's great to have Amelia telling her, us about her research today. And uh, she's going to talk about um, characterizing disordered materials with scanning and transmission electron microscopy. So thank you, Amelia, and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that um, kind introduction and also to the organisers for inviting me to present. I'm very happy to present in this webinar series. Uh, just a short note, I have a building site next door to my house. So um, if you hear uh, any noises of reversing large machinery, um, please forgive me. It's just the conditions that I'm working under at the moment. Uh, so I'd like to start um, by talking about my passion, which is uh, looking at um, the structure of glasses, uh, and then move on to um, highlight uh, some of the new instruments and workflows um, that we're developing at the Monash Center for Electron Microscopy uh, to look at um, disordered um, and sensitive materials at the highest resolution. So first of all, I mean, out of equilibrium and disordered materials um, are all around us. And very often they have uh, properties that the crystalline phase just does not possess. So for example, they might be homogenous and not have uh, any crystal grain boundaries to scatter light like glass and plastic and be transparent in the visible range. Mm -hmm. They might have um, a hierarchical structure like a bone or nacre uh, that gives them extra toughness. They might be metastable like the phase change materials in this PRAM. Um, or they might just take less embodied energy to manufacture, like amorphous silicon uh, solar cells, which are almost as conductive as uh, single crystal um, silicon. Or they might need to be dynamic as part of their operation, and this includes things like batteries or indeed life itself. Now, these materials lack long range translational order, but as we know, they do contain elements of randomness and also elements of short to medium range atomic order. They might contain different correlation lengths and hierarchies that reflect the process um, by which they were created. Now, unfortunately, these structures cannot be solved with traditional crystallography because traditional crystallography deals with structures that have this long range translational order of crystals. And so it's very hard to complete this virtuous cycle here, whereby we can strongly connect the structure of the material to their properties. Now, my passion, as I said, um, is glasses and glasses are an archetypal uh, solid that are always um, out of equilibrium. So these are solids that have no long range order that are quenched from a melt. So here you can see as we cool a liquid down from the molten phase, it can take two parts. So if we cool it slowly, it can undergo a first order phase transition to the crystal. Or if we cool it down quickly, it can enter this quasi equilibrium supercooled liquid phase here. And eventually, it'll fall out of equilibrium and solidify at the glass transition temperature. And it will form a solid that has a structure that resembles the parent melt, um, but at the same time um, has solidified. Now, in a glass, the local structure could be well defined from either bonding or packing considerations, but the order actually diminishes very rapidly beyond the first coordination shell. 
Now, the nature of glasses and this glass transition that I show here is one of the central mysteries of um, modern condensed matter physics. But there are also many uh, engineering problems with glasses. And here I'm going to zone in on metallic glasses, which are a special interest of mine. So for example, an engineering problem is how do we make glass forming materials um, that form more easily and thereby increase this critical casting thickness of glasses. Another question is why are glasses brittle? Why do they show this kind of brittle failure? Um, we understand uh, very well the uh, topological defects that mediate deformation in a crystal, but what are the atomic scale structures that mediate deformation in a glass? And what, if any, role does structure play in the above? And this is what motivates a lot of my research. So unfortunately, um, we can't determine the structure of glasses using current methods. And I mean, part of the challenge is that uh, in a glass, every atom is in a unique position relative to other atoms. And in fact, they have an infinite unit cell. Now, as I show here in a collaborative work done with Tim Peterson at Monash University, we can refine models of um, an amorphous solid or a glass to fit experimental data. And here we have done electron diffraction uh, and inverted this by Fourier transform to obtain the radial distribution function, which is the probability of finding atoms uh, separated by a distance r. So we can refine a model to fit this data and get these rather attractive uh, looking structures um, that have particle level detail. But unfortunately, the, pro the problem is ill posed. And so these structures are not unique. And so you can see here in this example, one of these structures obviously has a crystallite, a crystal has nucleated, and the other structure does not, but they fit the data equally well. So in this talk, I'm gonna um, refer to hard sphere glasses. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what the structure of these glasses is. And these are um, either model colloidal or metallic glass systems that have isotropic potentials. And really you can think about them as being uh, densely packed hard spheres that are sort of jammed together to a sort of optimally dense yet disordered structure. And so you can see here, from a small section of this model that's been taken out. The short range order is well characterized as being these close packed clusters where the center of one polyhedron is actually the vertex of another. And these short range clusters have a real spectrum of local order. So here I'm showing you the spectrum of different polyhedral types in one of these close packed glasses characterized by what are called the Voronoi indices where Ni is the number of I edged faces. And then the medium range or extended range order in these glasses is just how efficiently these short range clusters can pack together. Now, very early on when I um, started working at Monash, I realized that uh, a key to understanding the structure of glasses would be to look at information at the natural length scale of the order in the material itself. And so I developed this method based on scanning electron nanodiffraction, whereby you use a nanometer sized pencil beam of electrons scanned over your specimen. And at each point in your scanned array, you collect a full field diffraction pattern as a function of Kx and Ky. So here is a set of electron nanodiffraction patterns that I collected from a metallic glass. And you can see that um, you have uh, these diffuse patches of diffracted intensity. Some of them seem to contain these prominent angular symmetries that reflect the angular symmetries in the short range polyhedra in the glass. Um, but these symmetries are very subtle um, and, and difficult to dig out. As I continued my work, I realized that um, probe size uh, was really a key factor uh, in detecting these subtle angular symmetries. And you, I discovered that uh, when you tuned the probe size to the size of the cluster itself, 
the angular symmetries in the diffraction pattern um, increased in prominence. And this is why I think electrons will play um, a central role in the development of any crystallography of disorder. And it's because you can actually tune the size of electrons um, to um, the length scale of interest from sub angstrom um, up to the nanometer scale. And also that electrons interact uh, very strongly with um, the specimen. And so you can get information from small volumes of material. So to try to develop uh, a quantitative um, technique, uh, I investigated um, whether or not you could get fingerprints of a dominant local order from the averaged angular symmetries in my diffraction pattern. So you can see here for this icosahedron, as it rotates, you can see different symmetries appearing um, and disappearing as the structure is projected over different orientations. And so in a glass, if this structure is a strong motif, as you scan your beam along, you will sample this structure in many different orientations. Uh, and my hypothesis was that if you averaged the angular symmetries in diffraction patterns over all of orientation space, uh, then you would get some strong fingerprints of different kinds of local order. And so to test this, I calculated these fingerprints for different um, local structures, so simple cubic, body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, um, hexagonal close-packed and icosahedral. And you can see that indeed, these angular symmetries do provide quite strong fingerprints of order. So for example, the cubic structures all have the highest symmetry um, as a fourfold, hexagonal, the highest symmetry is sixfold, and icosahedral, which has the highest point symmetry, has a very strong symmetry magnitudes in the sixfold and tenfold. So to test this new method on um, a glass, I turned to the model system of charged colloidal dispersions. Uh, and these um, glasses have a very simple underlying phase diagram. So for example, where um, the uh, at low packing fraction, where you have the native repulsive potential from this double electrostatic layer, you get the underlying crystalline phase is BCC. But then as you add concentrations of salt and you screen this repulsive potential, the potential, um, the underlying phase uh, goes through this coexistence region where you get BCC and FCC uh, to finally the um, FCC uh, phase. And then when your packing fraction is increased, uh, then you form the glassy phase. Uh, and it's been hypothesized that the icosahedral cluster um, is a dominant motif in the glassy phase. So the icosahedral cluster, just to give some background, is a 13 atom cluster like the FCC cluster. Um, but unlike FCC, it has a strong five-fold symmetry. So it can't be periodically tiled to fill all three-dimensional space. Uh, and yet over the short range, the icosahedral cluster is actually um, takes up less volume um, than the FCC cluster, which explains why it might be um, a dominant uh, motif in a liquid. So I got uh, the um, average symmetry magnitudes from diffraction patterns of these colloidal glasses, and I fit them using my um, uh, different fingerprints. And so you can see that um, where we have no additives, so the, the uh, interaction is repulsive, we get a mixture of BCC and uh, FCC local order. As we add a bit of salt and screen that repulsive potential, the FCC order starts to dominate. Uh, and then as we add a surfactant and we switch the potential to being attractive, you can see that the icosahedral order starts to dominate. So this was a nice um, model demonstration of the method. Uh, but what about now if we turn to a more complex um, atomic scale glass, um, such as the copper zirconium metallic glass series. So copper zirconium uh, binary alloys actually have the largest glass forming range 
um, of all of the binary metallic glasses. And you can see here that um, on the copper ridge side of the diagram, the glass forming ability is much higher than the glass forming ability um, on the zirconium side. And the underlying phase diagram for these glasses uh, looks like this, uh, which is much messier than the model colloidal system. And so here in the glass forming range, we have um, three different crystal phases um, that are the underlying uh, equilibrium phases. Uh, and then as before, um, in the sort of liquidus up here, uh, the icosahedral phase has been hypothesized to dominate. So I collected some experimental data on uh, copper rich and zirconium rich glasses, uh, and I'm presenting these results um, over here. So you can see that um, for the copper rich glass, we have a higher proportion of these higher symmetry uh, icosahedral clusters required to fit the data. Um, and also a significant fraction of uh, two crystalline phases. Whereas for the zirconium rich glass, um, the two crystal phases uh, fit the data better. And I will admit that um, this fit is not, uh, you know, the highest quality fit. And I actually think it's because my, my model of uh, simple short range order of these glasses is potentially breaking down. Uh, I also checked um, my method uh, for an um, atomic model prepared by molecular dynamics of a 50-50 composition um, in the melt and also as it goes through the glass transition and solidifies as a, um, as a glass. And you can see that uh, similarly, uh, the melt requires a higher proportion of these symmetric icosahedral clusters, which seems to indicate that the better glass forming material has a structure more comparable to the melt um, than the poorer glass forming material. So to conclude this section, um, in my work, I've seen that um, if you really want to look at uh, the structure of glasses, then you need to limit the volume of diffraction so that you can interpret the features that you see in the diffraction pattern. Uh, and I've come up with a set of um, experimentally accessible order parameters uh, that seem to be able to quantify order in different kinds of glasses. And this is one of my favorite quotes um, about the nature of intelligence. So I didn't do this work by myself and I'd like to acknowledge um, some important contributions uh, from very talented Monash University students um, and collaborators at Monash University uh, in the science faculty, engineering faculty, and Monash Center for Electron Microscopy, uh, also external collaborators and the support of um, two grants. So now I'd like to um, talk about some of the new instruments and workflows um, at the Monash Center for Electron Microscopy um, that are really designed to extend uh, imaging and analysis using electron microscopy. Um, to air and um, beam sensitive materials. Now, I don't know, um, I'll just give a short introduction to the Monash Center for Electron Microscopy because actually I feel incredibly privileged um, to be able to work at this center. So it's a purpose-built ultra-stable laboratory where really you can obtain the ultimate performance um, of electron microscopes. And in recent times, the past couple of years, it's actually become a node of Microscopy Australia, which means that it's accessible to all Australian researchers under the Microscopy Australia access schemes. So at the centre, we have um, I've been developing, and I say we, but it's you know, mainly the uh, researchers and academics at the, at the centre who have been doing this, um, work, new workflows for sensitive materials. So for example, um, we've developed um, and commissioning a workflow for air sensitive materials uh, using a glove box and then also special uh, SEM holders and TM holders, uh, whereby the specimen can be transferred into these holders in a glove box um, and sealed. Uh, and then um, the chamber can open or the tip um, can um, go into the um, pole piece in the TEM, um, protecting the specimen uh, from uh, 
exposure to air. Uh, we've also given some consideration to beam sensitive materials. Um, of course, you know, glasses that are out of equilibrium, um, lots of other materials are. And so if you add any energy whatsoever, uh, then you can really um, change the phase or the structure of the materials. Uh, so in terms of beam sensitivity, there's a few processes um, that I'd like to highlight either in the focused iron beam where you're doing fib analysis or TEM specimen preparation um, or using SEM or scanning transmission electron microscopy for imaging and analysis. Um, and these are, so for example, for the fib, uh, your primary iron causes a cascade of effects underneath the surface of your material. Uh, the first of which is to knock atoms out of their um, places um, in the target material, causing a cascade of um, atomic scale defects and then eventually amorphization. Uh, sometimes these atoms can escape the surface, which is you know, the well-known sputtering that we use for uh, nano machining, um, causing a shower of uh, secondary electrons. Uh, as the iron travels through this um, cascade area, it actually slows down, losing energy uh, to the um, target atoms and causing localized heating. Um, and eventually the iron comes to rest and is implanted at a certain distance uh, below the surface. Um, in terms of the damage mechanisms uh, for electrons, um, some of them are um, most, they're mostly similar to ions. So if your electron is high enough in energy, it also has enough momentum to displace atoms uh, and cause um, defects and amorphization and also um, sputtering. So here for the a TEM foil, I've shown uh, forward sputtering of the atom. Uh, as the electron slows in the material, it also causes localized heating. Uh, and then the electron can also ionize atoms and cause bond scission and the creation of radicals that can diffuse around and cause further damage in your material. So in terms of limiting the damage of beam sensitive materials, um, which you know, cause uh, phase changes, local melting, re-solidification, vaporization, defects, amorphization, or preferential mass loss, um, if you want to limit um, these artifacts, there are a few approaches you can take. So for materials with poor thermal conductivity, heating can be a bad problem and usually can be alleviated by changing the energy of the beam, uh, the current, the current density, increasing the distance between your scanned points uh, or active cooling of your specimen using a special um, cold stage or cooling holder. Uh, displacement damage is severe um, for materials where the atoms have a low threshold energy for displacement. And the way to reduce this is by reducing the beam energy below this threshold. Now, ionization damage, which is also called radiolysis, is most severe for uh, insulators, semiconductors and organics. Um, but I'll note here is highly specific uh, to the material itself. Um, and this can be uh, reduced by uh, increasing the beam energy, which decreases the cross section for ionization, uh, minimizing the dose uh, or using cooling to slow down the diffusion of the radicals that are created. And there are all kinds of interesting things you can observe when investigating damage effects in a material. So for example, um, you can have dose rate effects, not just dose effects, and you can even have inverse dose rate effects as well. And I mean, the lesson to minimize all of these um, artifacts is to really maximize your signal for a given dose in the electron microscope. Uh, so one of the, um, instruments uh, that are um, being procured at the moment is this uh, triple beam um, electron microscope, uh, which is a collaboration between Monash and um, CSIRO um, and many other um, Australian universities. So this will have all the lovely features that we've come to expect from um, a modern 
FibSEM instrument, which is um, a gallium fib column for precision milling uh, and also nanopatterning and GIS deposition, uh, 3D tomography. Uh, it will also have a high resolution electron column um, for imaging. But in addition to that, it will have a third iron column using a low energy inert gas molecule, um, which is argon, uh, to remove the damage layers and the gallium implantation created by the fib. And it will also have a cryo stage for fibbing and observation at cryo temperatures and also some cryo transfer capability. So this instrument will um, be equipped with some high performance analytical detectors. So a new thing for Monash is uh, having a TOF SIMS on a FIB. Um, there's two others in Australia at the moment, which are getting some really um, interesting results. So here I'm showing an example from the literature uh, where TOF SIMS has been used to look at trace amounts of the light element uh, lithium. And because, you know, TOF SIMS um, it uses the iron beam to mill away layers of material, there's also the capability of doing this trace analysis uh, in three dimensions. So the um, triple beam microscope will be equipped with um, high efficiency EDS and EBSD detectors. Uh, so you can do um, EDS and EBSD in three dimensions. Uh, and so uh, just turning now to another instrument which is being installed and commissioned um, in 2021 as we speak. Um, that is the um, new flagship scanning transmission electron microscope, the Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, Spectrify. Uh, so this instrument is really, it's like a synchrotron in a lab, like it has so many different capabilities. Um, so this particular one is a double aberration corrected microscope. So you can do aberration corrected uh, TEM and STEM imaging. Uh, it will be uh, monochromated and also equipped with many different high performance cameras, uh, detectors, um, EDS spectrometers and um, electron energy loss um, spectrometers as well. So just to look in detail at some of their, the capabilities. So of course, um, you'll be able to do some beautiful atomic resolution imaging. Um, and here are some examples from the Monash Center for Electron Microscopy um, using the previous uh, Titan instrument. Uh, you will also be able to do um, microscopy in this uh, new mode called 4D STEM using a direct uh, detection camera. Now these cameras are uh, a new feature of um, advanced electron microscopes uh, that detect electrons directly. So they have um, a low noise characteristic, a very high dynamic range, and they can also detect data extremely quickly. So what this means, as I've shown here in this diagram, um, a lovely paper from Joe Etheridge, uh, is that at each point in your scanned array, you can collect a full diffraction pattern. And you can do this almost as quickly um, as you can collect a, a regular STEM image. And so here you can see the array of um, convergent beam electron diffraction pattern, which has been collected from this atomic column here. And you can see that because we collect here, like every electron, which has been diffracted from the material, we end up with patterns that are really sensitive to small changes in the structural symmetry uh, underneath the beam. Um, so this means that, you know, we can create these new imaging modes that are more sensitive than before to small physical effects that break the structural symmetry. And we can also maximize the information that we obtain for every single collected electron, which is excellent for beam sensitive materials. So also um, this instrument will be uh, equipped with um, advanced and high performance um, EDS um, and EELS detectors. Uh, 
So you can collect these signals at the same time as an atomic resolution STEM image. So here, the characteristic X-rays are collected uh, from the volume where they're excited, whereas we use a magnetic prism to disperse electrons and see um, what energy they have lost to different processes in the material. Now, I'll just skip over these sections a little bit because I feel like I might be running out of time, but uh, because, um, so eels in general um, show the energy loss of the incident electrons as they excite different processes. And because you can do eels with a nanometer sized scanning beam, you can actually map the probability of exciting these processes. And because um, this stem is monochromated, this means that we can access um, lower uh, energy losses than before. So for example, in this milli electron volt range here, you can actually map um, phonons um, pretty much, I mean, it looks here at the atomic level. Um, so other um, things that you can map in the ERI range include uh, the band gap of semiconductor materials, for example. You can have a look at localized surface plasmon resonances. So this is in the near infrared to the UV range here. Uh, and you can also map the energy of the bulk plasmon, which is proportional to mass density, um, as shown here for two different polymer phases. So going up higher in energy and looking at um, core loss eels and EDS, uh, you can actually uh, examine um, ionization processes uh, to map um, elemental concentrations. So here, just to review, um, EDS and eels, you know, uh, core loss eels basically look at the same process, which is ionization. So you have here an incoming electron, which kicks out an inner shell electron from the atom. Uh, in EDS, you look at the energy which is liberated as an X-ray when another electron relaxes back down to this level. And in eels, you look at the energy lost due to this ionization event. So here you can see um, with uh, advanced detectors, you can actually do uh, EDS mapping and also eels mapping now um, at the atomic level. So to conclude this section, I mean, um, MSEM is um, commissioning new instruments and workflows um, optimized for air and beam sensitive materials. Um, access will be via Microscopy Australia, but I always like to emphasize at this point that you know, the results I've shown here, like are really from the cream of the literature showing advanced electron microscopy, um, which does require highly specialized expertise and also a very large time commitment. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amelia. That was um, that was terrific. Um, I'm sure everybody enjoyed both the um, insight into uh, into your own work on the um, glasses, but also that uh, run through of exactly what's going to be possible in the new kit at, at Monash, which is uh, which is absolutely um, spectacular. So um, open for questions, everybody. Um, either um, if there's a, a quiet moment, um, just um, shout out your question or put one in the chat box um, if you'd uh, if you'd like to or, or to register a question or, or just say you'd like to ask one. So let me um, kick off with a um, let me just get my notes here with a couple from me. Um, Amelia, going back to the charged colloid um, studies that you mentioned um, earlier on, a um, couple of questions about that. In the case of the, the there's a, yeah, that's the slide. Um, in the case of the glassy version of that, I sort of, I can imagine how that's done. Um, that's a, it's a quenched colloidal dispersion, right? Um, <laughs> That's to, exactly uh, right. Yes, so centrifuged. Centrifuged. Interesting. To kind of condense the the, the structure, right? But uh, but I'm thinking about the sample itself. So is it actually run under at low temperatures, or is it run at room temperature? 
So um, there was, a, I had to skip over some of the experimental details. This was actually done using X-ray scattering because obviously colloidal particles are um, a bit bigger than atoms. Yes. Um, so it's the, the analogous experiment to the um, scanning electron nanodiffraction, but it's um, scanning small angle X-ray scattering. Right. Um, so I sort of to, I mean, to test my method using this model system with the sort of simpler um, phase characteristics, uh, I had to move it out of my comfort zone and go to X-ray scattering. So these specimens were um, quenched, as you say, uh, using a centrifuge uh, and then sandwiched between um, two capped on layers um, and kept, you know, at a, a 20 micron thickness um, and put into the X-ray beam. I see. Right, 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 right. Okay. So that's, that's a relatively, you know, doable um, procedure then. That's not particularly exotic in terms of experimental technique, is it? Yeah. Um, so then what, what came to mind having sort of thinking about that? Because that's beginning to, to get very close to electrochemical um, situation, shall we say, in the double layer. So the, the double layer in the colloids and uh, particles and the double layer in electrochemistry are more or less the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, but of course, electrochemistry is more fundamentally sort of two dimensional at the at the nanometer level than than three dimensional. So, I sort of started to wonder: was there a, a whole two dimensional branch of of what you're able to do there um, that is that is known or 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 possible? Do you think so? Can you? My question is: Can you imagine doing this on with some kind of um, electrochemical? Um, so, now it's electrode with a uh, some kind of quenched. Um, double layer structure uh, sort of present, which is what we want to examine is the double layer structure. Um, yeah, I mean, I um, I actually think the two dimensional case is much more ideal than the three dimensional case. I thought so. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, um, if you, um, and for, I, I sort of skipped over many details to try to be concise, but in my experiments, I really, really need to control the thickness of the material that I'm probing so that I can interpret the symmetries in my diffraction pattern. Because if I have um, too many clusters that I'm looking at, I'll have too much overlapping information and it will be too complicated to interpret. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually the two dimensional case is um, much more ideal <laughs> than having a, a three dimensional specimen. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really emphasize this in the talk, but um, you know, so I've sort of demonstrated the method um, over like a couple of different length scales. So, you know, the colloid particles were 300 nanometers and I did it using x-rays. Um, obviously the metallic glass are, are an atomic system and I, I did that using electron nanodiffraction. So I think there's a real scope for developing um, a uh, sort of more universal methodology for looking at disordered, partially disordered, um, inhomogeneous systems, and just having a look at different aspects of the order. Mm -hmm. Very, very much uh, interested in, in what's possible there. As I say, we've got uh, both um, in our group at Monash and I think the Deacon guys as well, with a lot of interest in uh, the structures that develop um, near an electrode um, in the, first few nanometers, basically. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the question is how to um, trap them or, or isolate that from the from the bulk, so to speak. Very interesting. OK, any other questions arising here? I'm just looking at the chat chat screen. Nothing there at the moment. I have a quick question, Doug. Yes, please, Jenny. Um, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Uh, hi, Amelia. Thank you. That was very interesting. Hi, so we've been, um, we always work with um, plastic crystals for quite a number of years, and I always wanted to be able to do, you know, high res TEM or even better resolution ACM, but they always just melt in the beam. So I guess my question is, is there any way to predict how well, you know, the materials that are going to respond well to your sort of three pronged approach of, of cooling, or, or is it always just sort of suck it and see and... Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit of um, suck it and see. So I have some uh, recent experience uh, looking at um, uh, conductive conjugated polymers. Mm -hmm. 
which have um, very strong uh, pie stacking order. And um, with, you know, the new um, single electron detection cameras, uh, you can really, and, and because they're so fast, uh, what you can do is you can collect your um, high resolution TEM data in a completely different way. So you can take an image, um, you know, at uh, different dose points, uh, and then you can track at what point the material starts to damage. Um, so to do that, I've been using um, the uh, Titan Krios at um, the Ramachiotti Cryo Electron Microscopy Center at Monash. And, um, you know, you can very clearly see, and I've done comparison experiments at room temperature on the um, microscopes at MSEM, and you can clearly see the effect of cooling, which is, you know, really transformative. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I would say, um, you know, for SEM and for TEM, I mean, depending you know, on the exact structure, uh, cooling could be very useful for preventing melting and damage. Um, the other people have observed that um, the damage in the TEM uh, from that uh, radiolysis and iron and bond scission um, actually depends critically on what side chains you have. So whether those side chains um, can become detached more easily and diffuse around and cause other damage, um, that seems to be the sort of key point um, when looking at um, damage in organics. Okay. All right. Well, it sounds like we should talk about maybe trying out some samples that would that would be excellent <laughs> i just invite yeah. myself <laughs> yeah i definitely do encourage you um to suck it and see uh when the ramachiotti center got the cryo fib um and i was trying to do some fib sectioning of um some uh, polymers it, you know previously they just sort of vaporized <laughs> at room temperature mm. but at liquid nitrogen temperature they basically just sliced like butter <laughs> So it's, I mean, it was, I, yeah. ideally, you want to analyze the material at sort of at room temperature or something without freezing it. If your material changes with with temperature, but cooling it enough to stop it melting, I guess is the the key. So that's that right. I mean, you just need to yeah. cool it enough. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting thoughts, Jenny. Um, any other questions? I just realized Jenny had her hand up and I didn't spot it. So anybody else got their hand up? Not that I can see. Um, I had one more, um, Amelia, about uh, talking about the new kit and you talked about the, um, the, the uh, depth, effectively depth profiling um, in, with one of the new setups. Um, and you had a picture that looked almost to me like it was uh, um, grains in a metal sample or something like that. Was that what that was? Yeah, this that one. one Yes, that's right. So, and I didn't quite see what what's the sort of what sort of depth are you talking about there? Um, so this is the uh, Toff Sim specimen. I actually put this up because um, I, I was uh, cognizant of the fact that people in ACES might be particularly interested in um, lithium. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so lithium, you can't actually detect using EDS uh, because the X-ray detector window um, actually strongly absorbs. Um, such low energy x-rays. And so that's why this top SIMS method, which people have just started to do on FIBS, um, is such a nice complement to EDS because it's much more sensitive to um, light elements. Uh, and also you can detect trace amounts of elements. So um, here, like you need to basically um, sputter off layers of material using your FIB uh, and collect the ions um, using your uh, SIMS detector, your time of flight SIMS detector. Uh, and then you can do this, this mapping of, of different, you know, seeing where there are concentrations of different elements. And so because, you know, you're in a FIB, you can do this many, many times um, and you can sort of, you know, dig down into your material um, and get like some Z resolution of... Yeah elemental concentrations that way yeah so yeah. it looks it looks like a really um 
really powerful technique. They have uh, one um, at the University of Wollongong um, that um, uh, they're getting interesting results from, and also one, I believe, I don't want to get this wrong, um, uh, I believe it's at either Curtin or UWA in Western Australia. So, uh -huh. okay. so, so that, that Z direction resolution was, was sort of what I was talking about or what I was interested in. The, the, um, the, the diagram on the right there, um, so what's the typical Z direction that you can characterize? Uh, do you mean like um, in terms of what, what size? You can, or, or what or what depth into into the surface can you can you go and, and get a meaningful result? So uh, I'm not an expert at sims. Um, I have to have to confess. Um, I so I think you know with the iron beam um, you could probably control the current so that uh, you took off slices that were about you know five nanometers in thickness, uh, okay. and then I think you could do this you know down to microns. Right. Um, right. But I do know that, you know, I mean, SIMS is, um, the technique is very sensitive, like the ions um, can be deflected by um, el electrostatic fields coming from the specimen. Um, and so I think if you dug too deeply into the material, you would probably get some shadowing effects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that could result in some artifacts. Um, right. Also, like looking at a specimen like this, I can imagine with the fib that this material would sputter, would have a different sputter efficiency to this material, which means that the depth would not be well calibrated. Right, right, right. Makes sense. So you mm -hmm. erode away some areas quicker than others. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, and you're quite right. I think that's um, that's very interesting with respect to lithium and lithium materials in terms of batteries and uh, some of the work that we're doing in our group on nitrogen reduction at the moment. Um, okay, thank you, Amelia. Um, any final questions before we wrap up, everybody? All right. Looks like. Looks like everybody's happy. Um, so uh, Amelia, thank you once again. And um, if anybody would like to uh, sort of pursue anything further with Amelia and uh, ask her any further questions, then I think you can just simply get in touch with her at Monash. So thank you once again, and um, we'll see you around campus when we're back allowed. <laughs> thank you, Doug. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everybody. Bye.